BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello, according to the poet Hesiod, hope was all that remained in Pandora's jar once all the evils inside had escaped and spread across the world. He wrote that in the 8th century BC, and ever since, philosophers have been divided over hope and why it remained. Was it something valuable that would help humanity deal with those evils, or was it another of those evils, perhaps the worst? To Hesiod, it was for the gullible, but St Paul and Thomas Aquinas turned it into one of the three virtues along with faith and love. Kant made it a cornerstone of his philosophy, while Nietzsche argued it was a delusion, and the debate continues. With me to discuss the philosophy of hope are Beatrice Hanpile, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Essex, Robert Stern, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sheffield, and Judith Wolfe, Professor of Philosophical Theology at the University of St Andrews. Beatrice Hanpile, why was hope in Pandora's jar in the first place? Well, we don't really know. I mean, <laughs> it's open to interpretation. And when we look at the myth, one important thing is to remember that it's a story of revenge. Uh, Zeus was angry at Prometheus for having stolen fire and given it to mortals. And so he decided to give us a gift of his own, which was Pandora and her jar. And her name means all gifts. But the gift was poisoned. Uh, so... Hesiod himself doesn't tell us the meaning of the myth. How you interpret it depends mostly on on two things. The first is whether you take hope to be a good or an evil. And the second is whether uh, you take the jar to be a prison that keeps hope from us or whether you take the jar to be a pantry that keeps hope for us. Uh, But either way, uh, it's not obvious because say if you say that uh, hope is a good, uh, then the question which is kept for us by the jar, then the question is, as you were saying, why was it in the jar in the first place? If you think it's an evil, then the question becomes, well, why would Zeus, who was bent on revenge, not have released it with the rest. So historically, there are two main interpretations of uh, the myth. Uh, One is what you could call the pessimistic line. It's the one that one could attribute to Hesiod, uh, that takes evil to, sorry, that takes hope to be an evil and the jar to be a pantry. And Hesiod, when he tells the myth, doesn't say anything about the value of hope, and he uses a neutral Greek word, elpis. Uh, But further down in Works and Days, he calls hope empty and no good. And the idea is that it deprives men from their industriousness. So the thought is, you know, instead of working, they just sit down and hope and then presumably start further down the line. So on that reading, hope is an evil. The jar makes it available to us. And every time we hope, well, we just uh, fall prey to Zeus's curse. Now, you've got the other line, uh, what you could call the optimistic line, which starts with the idea that hope is a good. So the first person who seems to take that line is a 6th century Greek poet called Theognis of Megara. And he says that uh, hope was the only good left to mankind. And then Nietzsche, when he looks at the myth, says that basically we've been taught by Christianity uh, to look at hope as a good. So on that second story, uh, then hope is a good that's in the jar for us to alleviate the evils. Uh, But one thing to note that is really important is I think you can only read the story in this way if you turn away from the original spirit of uh, Hesiod's uh, narrative, namely that it's a story of revenge. Uh, Because then it's not clear why Zeus would want to help us by giving hope as well as uh, the other uh, evils. And that's a friction point I think that Nietzsche picks up upon, so maybe we'll get back to that. Uh, But these are really the two main uh, lines. So how did Pandora get hold of the box? She was given the box. Uh, She was, yes, the the Pifos, the jar. Uh, Well, she was, uh, the story is that uh, Zeus asked Hephaestus to make a woman out of clay. That's Pandora. Then he asks all the gods and goddesses to give her gifts. And so she's endowed, uh, Athena teaches her craft, etc. And I think... Uh, Aphrodite gives her beauty, but also uh, a craven heart. Uh, and she comes with the jar. Uh, the jar is uh, part of uh, part of uh, the poisoned uh, gift, so to speak. She doesn't steal it. But one important thing is that when she opens it, it's on Zeus's order. Uh, but when she closes it, that's also on Zeus's order. But why does she close it so quickly? 
Uh, well, I don't know why it was that quick because every all the evils escaped, so I suppose. Except her, so she's a except, bit clumsy. Except, is, she, is that part of the plan? That she well, it is part of the plan. That's a really interesting thing. Hesiod says it's by the will of Zeus, uh, Aegis bearing. And so that's one reason why it's difficult, uh, partly of the Christians, to think that, uh, it, at least in the original story, hope is a good, because it's all part of Zeus's intent. Uh, you know that uh, it should be uh, it should be in the jar uh, with the other uh, with the other evils. Judith Wolf, Plato had something to say about good, didn't he? He did. Plato is an interesting question because he thinks, of course, that hope is often a vain hope. It's a passion of those who are uneducated, and so can be exploited. But he also does think that there is something like a true hope that we might once again by philosophy and love rise up to the knowledge or vision of the forms that he sees as being beyond the rim of the universe. And so there is a hope in the philosophical life that we might escape the body into which we were cast by our passion and rise up to the vision of the forms. And the Jewish idea of hope is very powerful as well, which feeds into later ideas. The Jewish idea of hope is very different. The Jewish idea of hope is that the history of the world is not cyclical, as the classical thinkers believed, but rather linear, that it moves towards an end. And the Jewish hope is specifically that that end is the fulfillment of a promise that was given with the creation of the world and reaffirmed by the election of Abraham, that God would come to dwell with his people or his people with him. And did these two ideas feed into the big shift in the idea of hope which came with St. Paul? I think you can say that, yes. I think if we're thinking with Pandora's box, Paul would have agreed that on a secular reading of the world, the negative narrative is the right one, that if there is no object to hope, then hope is in vain and is an evil. But the radical innovation, I think, is that he thinks that hope does have an object, that it's not in vain. And if we want to think with Paul and Plato or more even so with the Apostle John or the writer of the Johannine Epistles and with Plato, then the radical innovation is that whatever the good or the forms or the eternal, that it is Plato's hope or desire to view has come down to us and God has chosen to dwell with man in the figure of Christ. So for Paul and for the other New Testament writers, Christ by being the incarnate God who dies and rises again, makes possible the vision of a life that's no longer bounded by death. And that's what it means for him to dwell with God or God with man. But Paul brings it into this this extraordinary, important trilogy of love, faith and hope, which gives it huge status all of a sudden. So that's being right. the thing that was dismissed by Hesiod and not taking terribly seriously by Plato, is now up front. Absolutely. So for Paul, particularly in the Epistle to the Romans, in the Epistle to the Corinthians, Paul describes the life that we were made for, the life that creation is meant to be, as the life of an embryo that has become born or of a wheat that has sprung from the seed. And so for him, the present state is merely that of the embryo or that of the seed waiting to burst forth. And he says in Romans 8, for example, the whole of the earth is groaning in labor pains. So for Paul, our true life won't be fulfilled until we see God face to face in the eschaton. Three, four or five centuries on, St. Augustine comes in and adds his contribution to the development of this idea. Could you give us? Could you sum that up? Augustine is much more explicitly Neoplatonic, so he works much more explicitly in Platonic and Neoplatonic categories than Paul. And so, to some extent, Augustine transposes all of this into the category of time and eternity. He tells us in the Confessions that we are stretched on the rack of time, hoping for the release of eternity. And, of course, the famous words, God, you have made us for yourself. We are restless until we rest in thee, feeds very much into that. So for Augustine, temporality itself is merely a preliminary stage, something that stretches us out, that diffuses us, and that we hope to overcome in what he calls the beatific vision of seeing God face to face. Was it Augustine's idea or or St. Paul's idea that carried on towards the early Middle Ages? Both of them, I think we see in the early Middle Ages and through all of Christian history, really, these two basic strands of the Christian hope. On the one hand, for the renewal of the earth, 
the coming again of Christ. This feeds into all the apocalyptic myths that erupt whenever there is a great moment of crisis in history. And on the other hand, the idea that because we were made for something that is not possible within our spatiotemporal existence, the hope is for a rising above that existence into a heavenly one. Robert Cern, in some way, was the idea of hope being changed by new dreams of the future as the Middle Ages pushed on? Yes, I think you can trace through the development of ideas of hope and change over time as we move beyond the uh, Christian period, for example. So, I mean, if we're thinking about how does hope develop overall, some things, I think, stay the same within the tradition that we'll be tracing out. So the equivocal view of hope that we've had in Pandora stays through into the later periods, into the modern era. But as we move through to the modern era, obviously what we lose is a sense of or the, the, the full Christian conception of hope and the context for hope. Obviously that carries through into the Middle Ages, but as we move into more modern philosophy and more contemporary philosophy, that's what um, gets lost along the way. But I think one thing that becomes interesting as the history develops is how one thinks of uh, hope with the gradual loss of the religious context. So you still retain, through to modern thinking about hope, the idea that there's an object of hope, but instead of God, it's some other future or and a source of hope. Again, instead of being God, it becomes ourselves and the basis for hope that we have in our own virtuous development and a different ground of hope. You will get to that. I'd like to stay where we are in the sort of middle, middle, age, middle ages, rather pedantically, I'm afraid, sort of going, going, going through that. Is there anything in the early and later medieval notion of hope? Is it a one thing? Or are, are other ideas developing alongside? Is it seeding other notions which will come to play later on, like notions of utopia and stuff like that? Well, so one thing I think that comes into the... Um, um, Christian context, once you have the discovery of Aristotle and the interest in Aristotle, is the question of whether hope should be seen as a virtue. And well, he that, says it's um, a virtue because it makes you courageous, doesn't he? Well, he never actually calls it uh, a virtue, oh, um, it? but he does associate it with courage. Hmm. So uh, one can think of it perhaps in um, virtue terms. But by the time we get to Aquinas, um, it is then thought of as a virtue, but as a theological virtue, which obviously puts it in a very different framework. Um, in terms of questions of um, eschatology, um, so working towards an idea of uh, a second coming or um, a, 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 the end of history, as it were, obviously that does... Um, the notion of eschatology remains um, within the medieval Christian traditions and ideas of the ends of history, um, which again will develop into uh, the more modern period with different conceptions of the end of history. Beatrice, um, there were tensions between hope and faith in Christian thought. They were exemplified by um, Peter Lombard. Can you tell us what his view was? Yes, well... In, in the 12th the, century. Sure, well, in the, the inheritance he gets is the thought that uh, the three theological virtues, that's faith, hope and love, uh, ha have to be together. If you have the one, you must have three. And uh, he's not so sure about this. And so he asks two questions. The first is, well, does Christ need all three? And does Christ need all three? And secondly, do we uh, need all three? And in particular, could there be a tension between faith uh, and uh, hope? So the answer, Christ, the answer to that question is that Christ only needs love. But the tension between faith and uh, hope, I think, is an interesting one because it ramifies down the philosophical tradition, the theological tradition, to down to Luther in particular. So you can put it as a dilemma. The thought is this. Uh, faith is certainty about salvation. So if you have faith, then uh, you don't need hope because you know it's going to come. And if you look at the other end of things, if you are hoping for salvation, then that could be taken to mean that actually your faith is not strong enough. So uh, then the fact that you hope becomes a sign that uh, you're, not, uh, you're lacking in faith. 
So it's a difficult problem, and the Lombard comes up with an ingenious solution. Uh, he says that he, he redefines hope. He says it's the certain expectation of future glory. So how does that help? Well, it's because he thinks that uh, hope is proleptic. He thinks that hope is a representation of a future good in the present by the work of imagination. So the idea is that I can be sure because of my faith that I will be saved. But however, I can represent, if you like, that happy moment as something which I long for, which as a good which uh, I want to have through hope, so long as we think of hope, not as uh, bearing on the possible, but as he says, um, as a certain expectation. So he reconciles, if you like, the two uh, theological virtues, but at the cost, possibly, of removing the uncertainty, which uh, some might say is at the core of hope, because uh, certainly in ordinary language, you can only hope for things that you're not sure about. If, you're, uh, if you think something is impossible, you can't hope for it. And if you think it's certain, then you expect it, but you don't hope for it either. So his solution is really at the cost of transforming the notion of hope a bit. And then we come, Judith Wolf, we come to Thomas Aquinas, who, who, was, who had a big impact on this. Can you just tell, tell us what he added to the argument about hope? Thomas took Lombard's ideas about hope and ontologized them. And what I mean by that is he inscribed them in the way that he understood what it is to be human. So Aquinas takes the notion that hope is for a future glory and makes of it the idea that humans were made um, and called to an end which it is not in their own power to achieve. In other words, even though he thinks that there are things that make us happy in a natural way, he also thinks that our ultimate happiness is not one that we can naturally achieve. It's a supernatural end because it is, in some sense, communion with God. So Aquinas thinks that we were made for communion with God. We cannot achieve that communion with God by our own power, just as we can't achieve communion with a loved one by our own power without that loved one coming to us. And so he thinks that it's always an object of hope that we will indeed be drawn into that divine communion. And so hope for Aquinas is the refusal to deny that our deepest desire is for something that we can neither attain by ourselves nor do without. He distinguishes between ordinary hope and theological hope. Could you point that out to the listeners? Ordinary hope for Aquinas is part of his inventory of passions. It's one of the irascible passions, in other words, the kinds mean? of passion that represent a good or an evil as difficult as creating an occasion for courage or for fear, rather than a concusable passion, which is simply the enjoyment of a good. And so hope in the ordinary sense is simply an irascible passion. It's a, uh, it's a pleasurable anticipation of the possible fulfillment of a desire that might be difficult to attain, but can nevertheless be imagined as being attained. Whereas theological hope is not a passion, but a virtue. In other words, it's a habit of the will. It's something that the divine grace infuses in us. We can't have hope in the theological sense without receiving it as a gift from God because it's only by that gift that we can even imagine that we might have uh, a chance of attaining this fulfillment. But it's something that we have to train the will to believe in. He quoted the commentator, just in the, I think it's a wonderful quotation, God became man so that man could become a god. Mm -hmm. He takes that from many of the church fathers it's most famously said by Athanasius and the idea here I think is that Christ came to die and rise again partly in order to atone for sin but primarily not because sin is so great that it required such a great sacrifice to restore but rather because as I said before humans were created not yet fulfilled not yet complete but rather were created for a purpose that they could not fulfill without God becoming man so that they could become God. In other words, join the divine life in so, some sense. So Christ completed creation. Exactly. And the idea of hope, well, first of all, in the Christian faith, first of all, was because the hope was that there would be resurrection very soon after Christ's death. That didn't happen. So they find reasons why it didn't happen. 
and work out how to keep that idea going. With the, the odds were that he wasn't going to be resurrected in their lifetime, the next lifetime, the next lifetime, and so on. What, how did they a, a, a achieve that? Well, it wasn't so much the resurrection as the second coming. So That's what I meant, really. there, my, yes. my mistake. Yeah. So the, the earliest epistles of Paul and so forth do seem to speak to an assumption that Christ would return within their lifetime. And the later epistles of Paul and much of later Christian literature really is concerned with this question, why didn't it happen? And they do come up with... Uh, a good number of reasons, the most important of which, of course, is that the initial anticipation was not that the Gentiles would be part of whatever the promise was, at least among some of the uh, early Jewish Christians. And the realization that this was uh, a gospel for all of mankind and would therefore require a period of growth and expansion and spreading of the word made them think, well, maybe we have a bit more time now to gather in everybody. Um, another strand of, of rationalization, if you want to call it that, was precisely what I said before about the possibility that we might be talking about a completely different state rather than simply a return to this earth. And the other life would be another life elsewhere. Exactly. Yeah. And so the idea was transferred to post-death rather in some than their cases, lifetime. In yeah. some cases. I don't think the two have to be intention, but they certainly have been yes. in history. Robert Stern, what did Martin, Martin Luther add to this? So, 1517 thesis and so on and so forth. Yes. The blew up the Catholic Church. Right. <laughs> yes, so now we're talking about a rather different context, uh, the context of the Reformation, and um, that brings about, I think, some important changes. Um, so uh, one issue is the conception of hope as a theological virtue, which is central to the debates about uh, around the Reformation about how much one can develop the virtue to some extent by oneself and how much there is divine assistance. So as Judith was saying, even on the sort of more traditional Catholic view, one can't develop uh, the theological virtues all by oneself. But... Um, the virtues are there in, to, to to be developed um, to some extent by taking steps in the right direction. Um, and Luther is critical of that whole structure and doesn't want to think about virtues at all, doesn't want to think about it in what he took to be um, Greek terms. Um, and so what does he want to think about that adds to this argument? Well, so, so uh, uh, what were thought of as theological virtues become a matter of grace. And, and, and to that extent, he's going back to a sort of earlier language, Augustinian language of grace. Um, so it all comes from God, no, nothing from us. But also, I think, importantly, even related to that, um, the, the three virtues that we've been talking about, um, faith becomes the central one. Um, and I think he is thinking um, that hope, is, as it were, second uh, best or drops away in importance because um, for him, if you have faith, and again, in a way, going back to Lombard, um, as Beatrice was mentioning, if you have faith, it's not clear really what role for hope uh, there is anymore. Um, and so he he's viewing the, if you like, the ca Catholic structure um, where you have faith in certain propositions uh, or certain church doctrines, and then you could, that can give you hope. Um, but for, for Luther, faith is a matter of grace that um, you're in effect given, and once you have it, so he who is baptized and believed shall be justified, there's nothing more to hope um, beyond faith. So I think uh, hope is a problem from that point of view for Luther. Also, I think there's a worry that hope is a kind of block to the sort of despair that you're really going to need if you're going to find faith. And this brings us back to Pandora in a way, that hope uh, can be deceptive um, and turn into a kind of optimism that might be a, a, a block to faith. So, as I would understand it at least, the only place where hope remains is still at the eschatological level, the second coming and so on. That is something it's one can hope for, uh, but that isn't your own personal salvation or justification that is a matter of faith and hope drops away in importance Beatrice, um, 
Was one of the concerns about her was that it was necessarily beyond human control? Yes, well, I think it takes us back to the question of whether hope can be a virtue, because at least in, Aristot in Aristotelian terms, if something is going to be a virtue, it's got to fulfill at least two conditions. One is it's got to help you flourish, it's got to contribute to the good life, and the other is you've got to be able to practice it, you've got to, able to be able to develop it, to exercise it. Now, if you look at hope, it's not clear that this works, because we all know that hopes can be very foolish, they can be destructive, it can be irrational and so whether hope contributes to the good life or not is an open question and uh, it's not clear at all that we can practice hope it would be a little bit like I don't know practicing winning at the lottery because we can't make ourself, uh, ourselves hope we can't make ourselves cease for, uh, hoping and while hopes can go up and down it's not clear that it's because it's, uh, it's something that we do you know if you take a person who is ill uh, and who hopes to recover Offer. If the results of tests are good, then hopes are going to go up. If the results of tests are bad, then the hopes are going to go down. But it's not clear that it's something that she does. So if that's true, then uh, hope doesn't look like a very good uh, candidate for being a virtue. And uh, I think that's reflected in the fact that the Greeks actually don't really speak about hope much. Uh, and uh, when Aristotle speaks about the connection between hope and courage, he actually says that hope can get in the way of courage, because if it's good hope, as he calls it, uh, oelpis, then it gives you the confidence that things are going to turn out well. And if you have that, you can't have fear. And you can't, if you can't have fear, you can't have courage. So uh, the connection uh, here is not uh, obvious either. So maybe that's why, you know, uh, hope really doesn't feature very high. It's because it's not a virtue of control, if it's a virtue at all. And the Greeks were bent on, you know, measure uh, and self-mastery. So for the Christians, it's a bit the opposite. The fact that you can't control hope actually becomes a good thing. Uh, as uh, Bob and Judith were saying, it's got to be given to you by grace. And uh, it is a virtue in the sense of being a virtue of dependency, a virtue of powerlessness. By receiving hope, you realize that what you want most is not something that you can bring about, and that even the fact that you hope uh, is something that's given to you by God. So it's not a virtue of control, but that's okay, because anyway, uh, as Augustine thinks, you know, the virtues of the ancients are vices in disguise. So uh, you'd be very wrong to think that uh, self-mastery is good. And from that perspective, hope is uh, excellent, precisely because it's not a virtue of mastery. So uh, you may want to say, but well, if you're not a Christian, what should you think? Uh, and at the moment, so there's, there, there is contemporary debate about whether hope can be a virtue. Uh, the question is not settled. But one thing that's interesting to me is that the people who tend to think of it as a virtue then uh, move it towards the direction of control. They tend to think of hope as a special kind of planning or as positive thinking. Uh, and uh, then it becomes easier to see how it could be a virtue, but uh, it may be harder to see why this should be called hope. So uh, the question is open, I think. Judith Wolf, uh, how and why did uh, hope move, begin to move from the religious uh, debate into the secular debate? Well, we're really talking about the Enlightenment here and about the Enlightenment crisis of revelation. As you know, Locke said that the strength of our belief in something should be commensurate with the reliability of the source. And so even though Revelation, with its promise of a second coming or its promise of a fulfillment that's supernatural in kind, even though Revelation might be true, we don't have enough evidence that it is true. And therefore, it can't be the source of a hope that is founded in a promise. And so I think the philosophers then who continue to see hope as a virtue do so because they think that there's a rational basis for it. It's no longer because it's underwritten by a promise in Revelation. It's because it's underwritten by the structure of the world, by an inherent dynamic of the world, or by the structure of reason or the will, uh, as it is in Kant. And so we see a very interesting transposition of the grounds of hope, as Beatrice was also saying, from a promise given from without to something that's inherent in the dynamic of either the human being or the world as a whole. Robert, Robert Stern, 
when Kant, you brought up Kant, you addresses the problem, he puts hope quite highly. He says there are three things uh, about what I know, what can, what, what can I know, what can I do, and what can I hope for. So hope's up there in the top trilogy again. What's he meaning there? Yes, so um, many of the early <coughs> modern philosophers, um, so Descartes and so on, Hobbes mention hope, but largely in the context of passions and thinking about the passions and thinking more about just human psychology. So Kant, as you rightly say, gives it a systematic importance that it hadn't really had since uh, the, the, the medieval period, Christian period. Um, what's he meaning there? Well, it it connects fundamentally to Kant's conception of the relation between religion and ethics. Um, as Judith was saying, um, once you lose the idea of underpinning religion by revelation, uh, the question is, <laughs> what, what do you do for? with it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one way of seeing how that works is thinking about the title of one of the key works where um, Kant discusses this, Re Religion with the Lim Within the Limits of Reason Alone. Um, and it's a good title because it really tells you what it's trying to do. Um, it's religion within the limits of reason, so we're not appealing to revelation, uh, but within limits of reason, and, and Kant, uh, meaning by that, that Kant puts constraints on how far reason can replace revelation. Reason itself has its limits. Reason cannot establish uh, fundamental metaphysical questions, such as whether we have free will, whether God exists, whether there's an afterlife. So then there's a question of how we're going to get to and address those kinds of questions. And rather than leaving it uh, closed... Kant opens up another route, which is practical reason, not theoretical reason, um, which uh, the metaphysical route is blocked, but practical reason, which tells us about ethics. Um, that is, it tells us the moral law um, and tells us, for example, uh, uh, various actions that we shouldn't lie, but also sets us various moral ends or tasks, um, including working towards what Kant calls summum bonum, the highest good, and also our own moral perfection. What that licenses then is a belief, a glau what Kant calls glauber, something actually close to faith as much as belief, um, in certain what then look like religious claims, uh, that, for example, if we're going to attain the highest good, then a benign creator has to be possible. Hope... The question is, if Kant has established these various moral ends are possible, uh, the question is, how difficult or easy is it for us to achieve them? And that's where you need hope, because if they're too easy to achieve, um, then you will give up and allow God to um, bring happiness about without your efforts. But if they're too hard to achieve, then you'll also give up. And hope has this nice middle position um, where it will provide you the right kind of motivation. You hope for God's assistance, um, but you cannot be sure of it. So you have to make some effort um, while relying also on God's assistance. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, Nietzsche's view on hope was not all that different from that of Hesiod, was it? Well, it depends uh, on whether you're talking about the young Nietzsche or <laughs> later Nietzsche. So if we speak about the young Nietzsche, then yes, he revisits the story in Human All to Human. Uh, he bites the bullet and he says that hope is an evil. Uh, but uh, and so that it was it was kept uh, in the jar for us. But the reason why hope is an evil is different from Hesiod, and it's a really interesting one. It's not because it makes us lazy; it's because it's fundamentally deceptive, and it hides the true nature of life from us. I mean, the young Nietzsche is not particularly uh, optimistic about uh, life. Uh, he thinks that it's uh, endless suffering. And uh, what hope does is that it sort of makes us believe that there's a good just in our reach. And instead of uh, doing what would be the right thing, which is just give up and die, uh, we carry on and struggle. And the right thing is expressed uh, by uh, the wisdom of silliness in the birth of tragedy, which is that the best thing for you would be not to be born. And the second best <laughs> is uh, to die soon. So uh, hope hides that from us. But if you read it that way, what's really interesting is that 
but then it gives you a, a handle on what I've called the optimistic story, because you know the idea that hope is there to help us. Because then on Nietzsche's reading, you can see that the optimistic story itself is an illustration of what he wants to say in the pessimistic story. Because why do we think that hope is a good uh, in the optimistic story? Well, <laughs> because we're hoping it's so good, and so we're deceived into reading the story positively, whereas in fact it should be read negatively. And the very fact we were deceived shows that it works, so to speak. Hope is making us do that. So he solves the tension, you know, that I mentioned before between the idea that it's a story of revenge and why would Zeus help us, when on Nietzsche's, uh, on Nietzsche's story, Zeus doesn't help us at all. Hope is the worst of all the gifts. So that's the young Nietzsche. Uh, do you want to hear about the later Nietzsche, or do we not have time? Okay, uh, so I'll skip the middle Nietzsche and his criticism of <laughs> theological hope. Uh, in the later work, he he calls hope a rainbow. Uh, and he says that uh, we've got to hope to learn anew. And he doesn't give us any theory of hope, but I think there's two things that are worth saying. One is he he uh, change, he revisits his early ideas about deception. Yeah, hope is deceptive, but that may actually be a good thing uh, because it does help us to live. And now Nietzsche doesn't think that life is fundamentally a bad thing anymore. So hope is a bit like art in that respect. It gives us illusions that allows, allow us basically to carry on living. But on a more positive tone, he also thinks that hope has a transfigurative power. So it can make this life better. That's the difference with theological hope, which is all about another life. And he says, he doesn't say much, but he says one thing that's uh, worth quoting. He says, let your love of life be love for your highest hope. So there is a sense in which if you love life, uh, you have to have hope, and that hope is going to transfigure your relation to life here and now. So hope doesn't work like an ascetic ideal anymore. It's something that allows you to live in the present, but in the light of an imagined, you know, an imagined good. Judith, um, the link that uh, Luther made between hope and despair. Could you was that carried on in Kierkegaard? Yes, I think we need to go back first to the 19th century philosophers who come before Kierkegaard. We haven't and got time. I might interrupt. We haven't got time to do everything, so I've got to get a bit of a move on. Otherwise, very uh, well. You'll be Can I just say one very quick thing about yeah. that because it's very interesting. I mean, you have 19th century philosophers like Fichte and Hegel who do believe that hope is warranted by the dynamic of history, that we're moving forward. But the interesting thing is that hope is not optimism. And so insofar as these philosophers have hope, it's not simply that things will get better and better. It's that there will be a final state of fulfillment, uh, a final state in which there is a wholeness and a fullness of knowledge and of peace. But at the same time, these philosophers are so committed to a sense of life as something that's defined by learning, by progress, by growth, that the final state that they envision or that they hope for turns out not only to be the fulfillment of life, but also to be the end of it, because a final state is simply no longer recognizable as the sort of thing that they see as life and what defines it. So I think when we get to Kierkegaard and, and to Nietzsche, we see reactions against that, and maybe Bob has more to say about that. Can you say something about Kierkegaard, Bob? Yes. Uh, as you said, I think you can see in some ways Kierkegaard returning to the Lutheran position, and obviously he's happier to embrace the theological framework than, um, say, Kant had been. Um, so hope, genuine hope, has to be arrived at through despair. So I think that's where you get a nice and interesting distinction between hope as a rather shallow optimism, in effect, and a, a serious hope. Um, so just a, a nice quote from Kierkegaard, the higher soaring flight of hope is precisely by means of hardship and the pressure of adversity. That's the real hope. And then for Kierkegaard, the only genuine object of that hope has to be something eternal. Uh, earthly hopes will always let you down. Just, did hope figure much with the existentialists? 
Uh, I don't know whether there's such a cohesive group, but I can give you two snapshots if you yes, like. I'll try and make useful. it quick. Uh, so one is Camus and the myth of Sisyphus, and the other is Marcel and the sketch and, and for, metaphysic, yeah, uh, for metaphysics of hope. So Camus uh, takes Sisyphus, you know, and pushing his rock up a hill, and then the rock comes down every time, and then Sisyphus has to push back again. It's meant as a punishment originally, but uh, Camus tries to turn the story onto uh, into, onto its head and says, well, we got to imagine, Sisyphus gives us a model of a man who's, he says, free, uh, free of hope. And he's free of religious hope. He says, well, uh, this life is hell, so you don't need to believe in any, you don't have to believe in any uh, second coming. Uh, but it's also a life completely free of hope. Uh, he says that it's the total absence of hope. But he also says at the end of a book that we must imagine Sisyphus happy. So that's quite difficult. And personally, I have trouble. But I can think of two ways of imagining Sisyphus happy. One is a sort of grim renaissance. Uh, Camus says that Sisyphus is superior to his fate, that he's stronger than his rock. So yes, it's absurd, but I'm strong enough to live with that. And the other is a sort of ironic lucidity. Uh, well, uh, the whole situation is hopeless, but then I don't have to worry about it. And it's sort of even, even it becomes funny, you know, look at me, uh, here I am again at my rock. And Gabriel uh, Marcel thinks that hope gives us wriggle room, really. Uh, yes, well, he it's the opposite. He thinks a life without hope is a life in exile, because hope is what allows us. It's a sort of trust in the possible, hope in the strong sense. It's not propositional. It's not hoping that. You hope for something that you can't name. And it's a trust in the possible and uh, in the fact that uh, in ways that you can't imagine uh, in advance, uh, you can be transformed uh, by your hopes. He, com he compares the, the hoper to a swimmer uh, who uh, meets the currents with grace, who can't anticipate them, but who is able to be changed changed and to adapt and that's what hope does for you. How, what is the where's what's the state of the discussion about hope in contemporary philosophy, Judith? I think contemporary philosophy does to some extent grasp this nettle of nineteenth century uh, problems and tries to talk about a hope that's both inescapable and impossible. We see this already in Heidegger, and I think a lot of people take their cue from Heidegger here. Heidegger thinks that we are always oriented towards a future that we can't control or foresee, that we as humans are always incomplete in the now and are striving towards a wholeness of life that will only be there once all our decisions have been made, once we're able to survey our lives from the end. But of course, the irony here is that by the time we reach that we're dead. We're no longer there to see it. And so hope is ineradicable. We live in hope. And yet we have to admit that hope is also impossible. It's a sort of structural illusion. Thank you very much, Judith Wolf, Beatrice Hanpile and Robert Stern. Next week, will join us for the long march of the Chinese Red Army from October 1934 to October 1935, from which Mao Zedong emerged as a leader. Thank you very much for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. What did we really miss out? Can I just say that I'm sorry to be stopping on such a note of despair. And I would have liked to talk if we had had time and it doesn't really fit in. But I would have liked to talk about stories and particularly about somebody like Tolkien, who has a very strong view of the relationship between fairy tales in particular and hope. And he, as you'll remember, he says that just as tragedy is the true form of drama, so fairy tales are the true form of story, and that the essence of fairy tale is the happy ending. And so he thinks that fairy tales teach us somehow that despite much evidence, there might be what he calls a eucatastrophe at the end, a return, an unexpected return of the good, a joy, as he calls it, from beyond the world, poignant as grief. And I really like that, and I think it fits in with Kant's view of the summum bonum, of the good. I mean, this idea that our most deeply and tremblingly held hope is that when all is said and done, the good and the happy are one. The good will be the happy, and goodness and happiness will not be in conflict anymore. And so stories for Tolkien teach us perhaps the virtue of maintaining that kind of hope and so literature can be part of the practice of virtue answering a little bit to this question well how can we practice something like hope
Well, maybe by reading fairy tales. Oh, well, I think there's a there's a, a limit to that line of, of thinking, though, which is that uh, you have to believe in the summum bonum. So uh, it, there's a reason why it's called a fairy tale. You know, it's because it's supposed to be opposed <laughs> to reality, yeah. uh, where things don't happen like that. And so for me, it raises the question really of how far hope can be uh, severed from uh, the theological framework that makes it a virtue. Mm. Because of course, if you're a Christian you have no trouble believing in the, the summum bonum. But if you're not a Christian, you might think, well, that's a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's no wonder that, uh, you know, uh, the structure of a fairy tale replicates this. And to mm -hmm. me, it's really an open question because what, you know, what is fair if you are to have a sort of radical hope that uh, at the end something will happen, you don't know what it is but uh, somehow it's going to realize that hope, uh, then what is there to uh, support it? Mm -hmm. uh, if, you don't, if you don't have a God, what are you going to trust in? And uh, there's an interesting book, you know, it's uh, Radical Hope by Jonathan Neer, who tries to address this question. He tells the story of Penti Ku, which is, who is, sorry, an Indian chief, uh, who had uh, a vision, who told him that uh, he had to be like the chickadee person to survive all all the all the, uh, the the troubles linked to the uh, offensive of the of Americans against uh, Native Americans, and so uh, Plantiku was inhabited by that vision. He had no idea about how to maintain his way of life, but he thought that somehow there would be a way to maintain that way of life, even though he was seeing it destroyed in front of him because all the practices that made that way of life, the coup planting, the sundowns, every uh, you know, stealing horses and so forth. All that was dying. And so he saw really cultural devastation. And yet he had this hope, uh, inexplicable hope, that somehow the crow uh, could come out of it uh, and without being destroyed. So at the end of the book, uh, Leah says, well, you don't need to be religious to have that kind of hope. All you've got to believe in is the goodness of the world. <laughs> but then, of mm. course, that takes us back to our first mm. question. You know, how can you believe in that if you're not religious? And in a way, uh, you know, Plenty Coup had a vision. That's what allowed him mm. to hope. So mm. the question remains open, I think. Mm. Humanists would say they could believe in the goodness of the world even they don't have religion. Did you, what did you want to add, Robert? Well, I think, I think the worry that Beatrice is raising is that at a certain point this has to be amenable to evidence. So I think both Hegel and the pragmatists who we haven't mentioned think it's fine to begin with hope. In fact, that's appropriate. But at a certain point, uh, hope can be refuted. And, the, of course, the, the Christian structure, which is, again, something Kierkegaard always emphasises, is that from a Christian perspective, hope is never disappointed because, OK, uh, the second coming hasn't, hasn't happened today, but it could equally well happen tomorrow. And so you can maintain your hope regardless of, as you mentioned earlier, the, the kind of disappointments, the historical disappointments um, of the second coming not happening because, well, it could still happen tomorrow within a Christian perspective. Really but once you move to a more humanist one, it's not clear you've got anything to underpin that. Uh, uh, Either you replace it with a, just a metaphysical optimism that amounts to much the same, or at a certain point you give up. And I think that's a really interesting issue, say, within political debates about the role of hope and at what point should hope turn to something different, like anger, uh, rather than constantly hoping that the good will win out. Is there any sense that hope was an instinct that you can't do anything about? You, not only can you not control what might happen to it, but you can't control where it comes from. Uh, I mean, the man pushing the rock up might think this time, Sisyphus, mm -hmm. just this time, this time, it might not roll down. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly Camus doesn't think that. He thinks that Sisyphus is able to live without hope and because he knows the rock is going to come down every time. Well, I don't know about uh, this aspect of the psychology of hope, but there is a way of tying hope to agency, uh, which is the following. Uh, it's a thought that implicitly every time you do something, you hope that uh, it is possible for what you do to succeed, uh, because otherwise you wouldn't bother doing it. Uh, so in that sense, there is a, you could say 
say that hope is impossible to eradicate uh, mm -hmm. because so long as you are an agent, you have somehow to hope that it's possible for your actions to succeed. And then it would be sort of built in the notion of agency, strangely mm -hmm. enough. The city motto of St. Andrews where I live is Dum Spiro Sparrow, as long as I breathe, I hope. But there is also the question whether resignation at some point becomes an option. Um, and the better option... You mean resigning all hope? Yes. Um, again, faced with um, enough evidence, it seems that Sisyphus should just stop pushing that rock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it, maybe pushing that rock is what keeps him alive. <clears throat> if he doesn't push that rock, he's dead. So maybe at least, that would at be all right. pushing the rock. Maybe he didn't think so. Maybe he'd rather be alive than dead. Well, there we go. But That's then it hope. becomes a bit like Pascal's wager that you can try and talk yourself into a, a, a hope for purely instrumental reasons. But that would be a kind of self-deception, perhaps. Yeah, not, not, not the of real thing. Talk, yeah, mm. Yes, of exactly. Talk, positive uh, thinking. Exactly. And that isn't, I think, what we are conceiving hope to be. No, but one, from what you were saying about the political dangers, and now it sounds as if, you know, uh, hope certainly might not be appropriate in all situations. And then you've got two options. One is, uh, two opposite options, really. One is revolt, something mm. like anger. And uh, you give up on hope because you think it's not going to happen and something's got to happen now mm. uh, and the other is resignation yes. uh, where you don't get angry uh, but you stop desiring something uh, some, uh, something like that yes. uh, and these seem to be two possible outcomes if you cease uh, to hope or mm. if hope cease to and be and again it's an interesting question I think whether anger also has to have some element of hope within mm. it um, yes so I think yes ultimately perhaps the only option is res pure resignation and, and there are figures in the history of philosophy which you haven't mentioned who are suspicious of the will and suspicious, suspicious of notions of freedom um, I mean the Stoics we didn't mention Spinoza we didn't mention, these are all people for whom the notion of giving up agency is fine and that's precisely well they're the, the ultimate enemies of hope perhaps that's right but then um, that's that ties to the idea of uh, the intrinsic link between hope and agency yes uh, very neatly because if you take that seriously so you can't do anything without hoping that somehow you can succeed then the question applies to resignation itself you yes. know is that something that you do and yeah. then if it is something that you do then presumably you got to hope somehow uh, yeah. that you can <laughs> uh, stop hoping and that creates a paradox mm. And I think uh, people like Schopenhauer, for example, whom we didn't talk about, or Lökstrop, uh, whom Bob, I'm sure, would love to talk about, <laughs> uh, are uh, very sensitive to that. That's why Schopenhauer says that actually you can't resign willing yourself. It's got to be sort of drawn out of you. And it can be drawn out of you by suffering, by excessive suffering, where uh, then, then comes a point where he says the will to live is killed in you and, and you just sort of carry on, but you go through the motions, that's all it is. But it's not something you do, and so it avoids this obstacle of, well, if I resign, I've got to be able to um, hope that I resign. And uh, the other one is to be claimed, he says, to realize that your own perspective is so limited uh, that uh, you can expand it and have empathy with the whole world, in which case... Uh, then uh, you, uh, the, the will to live sort of extinguishes itself because it realizes the amount of suffering through the will and it realizes that the, the joy of one living being is the, the unhappiness of another. And so there's a sense, a metaphysical sense, in which the will uh, ceases to will. But again, it's not something it does. In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Simon Tillotson. Why is it that some people pretend to support a football team? It's important questions like that I'll be looking to unravel with the help of top experts, psychologists and some big sporting names in my new podcast, Don't Tell Me The Score. We'll be dissecting sporting themes like tribalism, the power of belief and the art of resilience to uncover important answers about life and the world around us. Forget the results, tactics and cliches about two halves. This is a sports podcast the likes of which you've never heard before. Subscribe to Don't Tell Me The Score with me. Simon Monday on BBC Sounds, 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 on BBC Sounds.